Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Ellen, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Ellen. You can take the other one down, too. <laughs> now I can see everybody. And my uh, and I am from Buena Park. <laughs> Not too far away, just 20 miles off. Um, I was born in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, and I came from a home where um, I I was I felt uh, no self-esteem in it whatsoever. My mother would always put me down and tell me that everything was wrong with me and never, you know, do anything. And my father was just, uh, well, in La La Land, let's put it that way. It's a nice way to cover up a... A, a disaster. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, um, I, he, my family did not drink. That neither my mother my, the, nor my father drank. And, but I did have uh, come from a line of uh, real rough alcoholics. I had four uncles that died of it, and uh, then I had a cousin that died, uh, and I had two cousins. One flew out from Ireland on a Geographic, and he died of it out here, and. Uh, there was there was plenty of it around, and it just skipped a generation, I guess, because I was the only one in my family that was an alcoholic, and and uh, the yeah, the ch- the other children uh, were all younger than I was, and I I'm the only only member of that family alive today, and it's a strange feeling because I went through so much. My my uh, story and my disease took me into the gates of hell, literally into the gates of hell. And AA brought me up, uh, uh, right up into into heaven. It, it did. This, this program works, but we always have to work it. I uh, left that home as, as soon as I could. I had to, I had started to drink, and I remembered my very first drink. I was at a dance, and I was hiding in a corner because uh, I was too bashful to, to dance, and I couldn't dance. I'd stumble over everybody, but my mother insisted that I would go to this YWCA. She says, now you'll have a good time. Well, I, even today I wouldn't have a good time at a YWCA dance, let me tell you. <laughs> no, sir. And uh, so uh, th- I was asked one night out to uh, the alley. They had a bottle of wine. And I, and I went out there. And, and I, was, I remember I was looking down. I always looked down. I never looked at anybody in the, in the face. I was shy. And uh, just, I, I always felt less than anybody else. And this bottle came around, and I took it, and I just, op- you know, did what, put it down like a Coca-Cola. And by the time the bottle came back, something was happening to that world out there because I was becoming very comfortable in it. And I was become, and I was starting to straighten up, and I'm trying to look like somebody, you know. And, and it was different, and I loved that feeling. And I, I just vowed right there and then I was, would always drink. I would always drink. I would drink to the day I died, and I damn near did. <laughs> I uh, didn't take me long to uh, get away. I went over to Vancouver. I went with. I took my younger sister with me, and uh, she. It was at the end of the depression, and, and jobs were hard to get. So I, I did a lot of housework and stuff. And she got a job in a nightclub. She was a dancer, and it was a Chinese nightclub. And so uh, one day I went up there to watch her rehearse, and the band was there. And I'd had a few drinks, and I picked up the microphone, and I started to sing, and they hired me. And I thought, oh, my God, I was in pig heaven. I really was. I just thought that was the most wonderful thing in, on earth. But there was something I didn't know, and there was something they didn't know, was that I couldn't drink. I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't sing when I, I didn't have a drink. And if I had too much to drink, I'd forget the lyrics. So they... Finally, they, they could see that I had no control over my booze, so they put the p- piano player in charge of my drinking. And he was supposed to keep me on that level. You know that level you get at when you're feeling just great, just before you get sloppy drunk? <laughs> and I always wanted to stay on that level, and I never did. Because the first time in that alley and I took that wine, I was an instant alcoholic. It was just instantaneous. Uh, I had to do a lot of more drinking, you know, uh, uh, to uh, to get into the sloppy, but it was doing everything for me and nothing to me, and I loved it. So I, uh, I, pretty soon, you know, the the piano player was failing in his commitment to keep me on a, a level, and uh, I knew I was going to get fired, 
And so this night, a great big Swede logger came in from the North Woods, and he had a bundle of money like that, and I fell in love with that money, and I folded it out the doors, and we were married a week a week later. And uh, he had to go back up to the logging camp, and he said, well, I'll send for you when I get a house, and, we'll, and I'll have it fixed up. And, we, and so I said, oh, that's great. And uh, I really didn't... Uh, you know, I really loved that man. He, he, he was, the real, only reason I loved him is he drank like I did. He was a wonderful drinker, I thought, you know. He, he never hesitated to take, uh, hesitated to take a drink in the morning and, or anything. And he, we went through his money real fast and he went back up into <laughs> logging camp. And I wanted to, uh, I was to follow him. Well, after a while, he had the house ready and I went up. And it took quite a while for us, the steamship to go up because it stopped at every little port. And it was about four o'clock in the morning when I was left on a dock, way out in the wilderness. There was no human habitation around. There was only this dock, and this this uh, tug was supposed to pick me up. And finally, about a couple of hours later, I'm hanging. I'm sitting on the dock with my legs hanging over because I can hear things in the bushes back here, and and I just knew there were wild animals, and there were. And I thought, oh, I'll jump in that water, and a wild animal comes out after me. But anyway, the tug came and took me up to the logging camp. Well, we kind of settled down, and um, it, it, I found out very shortly that that there was the there was no town around because I had offered to go and drink up all you know drink get some booze there if uh, because he he was mad because I hadn't uh, brought some with me. Uh, well, I did. I started out with him. We had a party on the ship. Well, that was about the only problem. I was telling him all about the party that he wasn't in on, and that so uh, anyway, uh, it didn't take me long to find a source of supply. Uh, I was walking down this walkway, and all the houses were on floats. It was a two-room shack with an, a, lo- a, a long log out to the shore, and at the end of that, sh- that sh- almost at the end, was uh, the outhouse. Now, if you get drunk and you, you go to the outhouse, you're going to fall in the water, Nine times out of ten. And that's the most sobering thing that you can have. <laughs> anyway, uh, this woman asked me if I would like to have a glass of home brew, and I said, well, what is it? And she said, um, she said, it's uh, homemade beer. She said, would you like some? And I, I beat her in the house, you know. I said, <laughs> I, I said, is it, is it real beer? And she says, oh yeah. And, it, oh yeah. And so I, I sat there and I drank it and I asked her if I could have another glass and she said yes. And, and, uh, then I said, do you give, have the recipe of this? And she says, oh sure. And so we sat there and we wrote all, all this recipe and I'm drinking and I keep on asking her some questions so I can stay longer and drink her homebrew. And finally she poured me out and sent me home, and my old man came home, and he said, how on earth did you get in that shape? And I said, well, I've been drinking homebrew with Mrs. Beaton, and I waved this recipe at him, and I says, and I've got the recipe. And he says, let me see that. And we put that, he put that on the table, and he read it all, and he says, God, girl, we've got to send for that stuff. I says, I think so, too. And, and, and there we were. So we got all this stuff up. It took a matter of weeks, you know, for it to come up. And you, you have to get the, the barrel and the hops and the bottles and the bottle cappers and everything that goes to make homebrew. And finally it arrived. And we started to stir this stuff up, and we put it behind the stove, and everything was all right for a while. But this stuff started to ferment. Now, for two alcoholics... To live in a two-room shack and smell those smells, it'll drive you up the wall. Oh, God. And he'd say to me every morning, now, don't you start bottling that stuff until I get home, will you? I says, no, I won't. Well, the day came finally. I could stand it no longer. So I um, I said, well, I'll just sterilize the bottles. And this woman had told me, be sure that you sterilize those bottles well. You just, if you don't, you'll have bacteria in it. The bacteria will ruin your beer. And I thought, there's no way. Well, you know, there's no way that that you'd let anything um, eat up all your beer (laughs) before you could get to it. And so I sterilized them once. And I put, you know, put them in the oven. I brought it up to the temperature, she told me, and left it there that long. And then I cooled them down. And I thought, she said that the bacteria might do that. I better buy do that twice. So I put them all back in the oven again, and we sterilized them again. And finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. And I thought, well, I think I'll just taste it. I'll put the hose in this thing. And so I put the hose in it, and I sucked it. 
And, oh, it was good. And I just sat there, and I sucked it and sucked it. <laughs> just kept right on sucking out of that hose. The old man came home. He says, I thought you were going to wait until I came home. And uh, I told you not to put it in the bottles. I says, there isn't any in the bottles. And he sat down, and he grabbed the hose, and he sucked on it. I sucked on it. And we never stopped sucking on that thing a- until... The last drop was gone, and it was a big. It was a. It was took us several days, you know. <laughs> and we're still, th- and we have to wander out to the outhouse. <laughs> and of course, we got so drunk and sloppy drunk, and everybody in camp knew we were drunk, and they all they all knew him. So he, they thought he had a good, pretty good partner, and we got along fine while we were drinking. And then I remember the first time we came off of this drunk, we were sick. Oh God, we were sick. But he says, you know, we've got to send for some more stuff. And I says, yeah, I know we do. And we sat down there so sick and took turns puking and, and sending for more stuff that was making us this sick. And, and it was terrible. And so, you know, I was up there eight years with that man before we got a divorce. And uh, he was, um, he, uh, we always had a brew on. And we always did exactly the same thing. I always sterilized the bottles, and I've always sterilized them twice. And I never never put it in bottles, and I don't recall ever putting it in bottles for eight years, but every time I sterilized them. I, see, once I took a, I would say, this time it's going in the bottles. This time it's going in the bottles. And this time I can't wait, you know, and I would, I would uh, do it. You know, it was just every time was exactly the same. I never got it in the bottles for eight years, and I sterilized it. That should have told me something, but it didn't. It didn't tell me a damn thing. Anyway, the marriage broke up, and I went back to Vancouver, and I got a job. And now I'm a full-fledged alcoholic by this time. I've got to have the morning drink. And uh, so I would lose my jobs. And I lost about three jobs in a row. And uh, I thought, oh, well, I'm just not caught out to this kind, you know, to be a professional person. Professional person. I think I was walk- working in a Western Auto Supply as a sales girl. <laughs> this was a profession. And so uh, I, uh, I thought I got the bright idea. I think I better get married, have somebody to take care of me, and I'll get, have a bunch of kids. That'll do. That'll, that'll quiet me down, you know. I won't be able to drink. So I, I got married, and God, he didn't stay with me but about two months. He couldn't stand the way I drank because he just knew what was wrong with me. And so he left me, and so I went back, and I got another job, and I got fired from that, and I just kept doing this. And uh, so finally, the last husband I had while I was up in Canada, he had got the bright idea that he wanted to come down to California. And so we went through all the performance, you know, the... Um, uh, all the all the things that you have to fill out, and uh, we were just about ready to find out whether we were going to get through or not, when uh, the last piece of paper was put up in front of our faces, and on the top of it it said, "The following type of people are not welcome in the United States," and they were convicts, felons, drug addicts, alcoholics, and prostitutes. So, and then they had these little yes and no squares. So I looked at this, and, and I thought, well, I'm not a convict. And I put, uh, I put tick the no one. And uh, then I uh, wasn't a felon. I wasn't a felon then. I became one after I got down here. But <laughs> uh, it was reduced to a misdemeanor after a while and is no longer on my records. <laughs> and, so, and so I took, put that one. I ticked that one no. And I knew I wasn't a drug addict, and I didn't... Uh, uh, I wasn't a drug addict then, but I sure got into some drugs down here, but they didn't have what's out there now. They, I, you know, I, I could never see anything like, like crack and cocaine and all that kind of, but I did get the diet pills and the, and the bennies and stuff. I love to get high, but I didn't like any of those downers. Oh no, I had to be high all the time. And, uh, so, uh, I didn't, uh, I knew I wasn't, uh, I was, I knew I wasn't a drug addict and I knew I wasn't an alcoholic because a man had, I was riding on a streetcar one time and this man looked out the window and he nudged me and he says, look at that alcoholic woman over there. And she was standing there. She was a heavy set woman and she had a moo moo going right down to the ground and she was drinking something out of a, a brown paper sack and five old men were st- standing around her waiting for their turn. And you know, I, I knew that, that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, um, 
an alcoholic because, you know, I just knew I didn't even own a moo-moo, so I, well, I wasn't an alcoholic. <laughs> and then I came to the prostitute, and I was very sure I wasn't a prostitute because prostitutes charged for it, and I'd been giving it away all over town. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know any better. <laughs> I know better later, though. <laughs> anyway, we came down to California, and in the bars, you know, these cocktail signs, they just twinkled at me, and I loved I love California. I love it now, and I love it. I loved it when I came down. And I got rid of the guy, the, the Canadian, last Canadian husband. Now, I'm not going to tell you how many times I've been married at the end of this thing, because I'm not too sure myself and my husband doesn't know. And he's sitting right there, but he doesn't know. And besides, I think I'm missing a couple of divorce papers. I'm not too sure whether I got divorced from him or not. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, you know, I'm just I'm just in La La Land all the time. And so I got a job at a bar, and I went into a, a nice dinner house. Well, I the, I drank uh, I could drink on the job, you know, to a certain amount. And so if it was only a certain amount, I could uh, I could handle it. But you know, pretty soon I'm begging one bartender to give me a drink and then go up and get one from the other, you know, and they each think that they're only giving me, that I'm only getting one from him and I've got, and I'm getting drunk and so I lose that job. And then I go down to a, a lower job and um, my drinking is, is, my disease is progressing and it is a very progressive disease that we have. I had a sponsor and she was a wonderful lady and she was a, just a wonderful sponsor and she decided to go out one day after 20 years sobriety, she started drinking in the morning and at 10 o'clock, and she was dead by 4. And that's the progression of this disease, even when you don't drink. It's always progressing. It's going to be just as if you had been drinking all that time. And so I just, God, it was terrible. Uh, anyway, I got to, um, I got to uh, getting the idea that I better start controlling my drinking. I, I think I'll just... Uh, I'll drink beer only, and I had to drink great gobs of beer, and I'm now, I'm now in a lower type of, not a bad bar, but a lower type of bar, and uh, so the, uh, I, I drank this beer only, and I thought maybe I was having, had cancer of the kidneys or something because I was going to the bathroom all the time. I just didn't think that it could be the beer that was doing all that, but I was getting fatter too. And I complained one night. I said, I can't get in any of my clothes. God. And this woman says, oh, she says, come on over to my, to where I work. Uh, I work for a doctor and he has those nice little diet pills. And she said, they'll peel, peel that fat right off of you, and you're going to feel so good. It'll make you feel wonderful. And I said, no kidding. I was there the next door, door. Next morning, she took me into his office, and I took a look at that man. He was the fattest little turd you ever saw in your life. <laughs> he had a big pot belly. His face was like this, and his fingers were like this. Did I say to myself, if these pills are so good, why in the hell isn't he taking them? I could just remember it. They're going to make me feel good, and they're going to make me feel good. And that's how I got started on those. And then it took no time until I had all the bennies, a good supply of bennies. And uh, I, I just went on down the skids. Right all, There was no one there to stop me. I never, I didn't get married again, uh, you know, for quite some time. Uh, I had a good 10 years to all on my own, and, and, but I'm getting worse and worse, and I'm, tr and I'm trying all kinds of different things. And I'm doing all kinds of different things that I didn't want to do, and I would wake up and I would be ashamed. And one of the things that I did is I seen some girls putting something in a guy's drink, and I said, what did you put in there? And they said, a Mickey Finn. We're going to roll them. And I said, oh. So I watched, you know, just calmly watched. And after they had done it and he got sick and they rolled him, I said, have you got any more of those? See, I was trying to roll guys once in a while, you know, and, and uh, of course I would be drunk. And they would beat me up because, so I thought it, it was all right, you know, just to knock them out. And then, you know, that it saves me a beating. <laughs> and this, this is the way it went. And, oh, God, it, it, finally, uh, you know, I get down to skin and bone. And I'm, I'm really trying to fight this now. I, I'm getting right down there. And I can't get jobs anywhere, hardly. And uh, I, I moved to Wilmington. And while I was in Mil Wilmington, I was uh, drinking right down on the Avalon Boulevard. And if you know where Avalon Boulevard is in Wilmington, it's Skid Row. It goes right down to the docks. And that's where I would go to drink. And a friend of mine that had, had known me when I first came down, she said, why do you go do that? Why do you go down and drink down there? 
I went down there because I was the only place I was comfortable in, and I had to drink. And if I go to another bar, I was less than, no matter how much I drank. <coughs> so um, anyway, uh, the t the disease of mine just just went down the way, and I thought I have got to do something. And I would try staying sober for a little while, and I would try everything. Sometimes it would work a little bit, but not always. And so, not one night, I uh, I. Uh, I got the bright idea that I, I I need exercise. That's what I need. I need exercise. So I joined Vic Tanny's gym. And so uh, I working till 2 o'clock in the morning when I was working, I would um, be real hungover, and I would get to the gym at about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was sick. And I'd just look at those stairs. There were a long flight of stairs, and I'd go, look at it, and i think, my God, I cannot go up those stairs. I cannot make it. So I go into the bar next door and I get all my pills out. <coughs> and then I get a drink. And then I would sit there and I would put, throw the pills down me and chase it with a drink. And I would sit and wait. And I remembered something that I had seen that I identified with. And it was that little spaceship, Spudnik, that the Russians put up. It was a little spaceship. And it was sitting there in its base, you know, and it shook, and it shook, and I was sitting on that bar stool, and I was shaking and shaking, and all of a sudden that spaceship took off, and all of a sudden I took off, and I ran up those stairs, and I ran into the back, and I got into my, into my clothes, exercise clothes, and I'd be just going like anything. And the, the instructor one time said to the other ladies, she, he said, well, if you would like to have a figure like that, you could, uh, you should exercise like that. Hell, they couldn't exercise like that anyway, because I was wired. You, I couldn't have, you couldn't have stopped if you'd said, said, told me that. And that was the condition that I got into. I, uh, I decided that I better do something about this. And I thought, well, Maybe I'll just get away from it, and I'll get married again. So I went out looking for a husband, but, you know, I couldn't find one. Not, nothing. But finally one turned up, and uh, he was not, I don't think he was in his right mind to take me, but I think he thought he was going to teach me how to drink. Because he often told me, he says, now, l let me teach you how to drink, and, and you'll be all right. And he would teach me how to drink, and I would have one drink, and then I'd have two drinks. And he says, now, isn't that good? And I says, yeah, I feel fine. Of course I felt fine. I had two drinks. And he says, let's go home. And so I would go to the bathroom and go out the back door. You know, <laughs> I'd just go away. <laughs> and I'd come home a few days, days later, and he'd say, where have you been? And I'd say, I don't know. And finally, he, he says, don't lie to me. You know where you've been. I didn't know. I'd been in a blackout. I didn't know most of the time where I had been. And uh, anyway, it was long about this time. We got married, and, and it was shortly after that that the cops came through the window and arrested me. And that was my felony. And... Uh, so they uh, wanted to take us, take me down to the Long Beach City Jail, too, and I sure didn't want to go. Because I had been down there on several occasions, but not for bookmaking. It was for other things, you know, <laughs> that a girl lives on out there. And so uh, I, uh, I, I, and I had Mickey Finns in my purse, and he told, they told me to bring my purse, and I couldn't take them out in front of them. So I went, I said, could I change my clothes? And they said yes. And so I went in there. And I ditched the Mickey Fins, and I turned around, and there was a bundle of maternity clothes there that I hadn't passed on to somebody else that needed them. Uh, and I thought, I bet if I put those maternity clothes on, they wouldn't take me down to the Long Beach City Jail. Well, hell they won't, because <laughs> I walked out of that door, and I looked at these cops, and I'm trying to look pregnant. By this time, these pills have got me at like 90 pounds, and, and I'm look, trying to look pregnant. And the cops had the funniest look on, the fa on their faces, but the funniest look of all was that on my husband's face. <laughs> he knew nothing about this. <laughs> so I, I sidled up to him, and I said, I was saving it for a surprise. A and, <laughs> and, you know, I'm the kind of a person that if I, if I lied to you, I would not ever say, yes, I lied to you. I would stick by the lie. I would just stick by the lie. I, I don't, you could just hung me to the yard on I would never have told and so when we came out of, out of the, the got, we got out on bail, and he says, why didn't you tell me? So I didn't tell him and, and I, that, that I wasn't pregnant. I said, well, I told you I was saving it for a surprise. I wasn't too sure for a while. And then I just, you know, didn't, I just thought it would be a bigger surprise, and it went on like this. 
And so he just decided that uh, I, that's not after me, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we got out and we went, we went to court and I, I'm in maternity clothes. And they, uh, and so the judge saw me in maternity clothes and he remanded me over to the probation office for investigation prior to sentence. And uh, so I had to go there. He immediately sentenced my husband because he'd been up before, and he got uh, probation and a fine, and I had to go through this. And I thought, God, if they put me in prison, how am I going to deliver a baby? My God, you know, what will I do? Could I sneak one in? Could I, I can't even steal one or anything. I, don't, I didn't know what to do. And finally it came the dawn. You know, I, my brain no longer is functioning properly because uh, – I'm doing strange things like watering the neighbor's lawns at night and their gardens and sometimes washing their windows. And I, th- you know, and I thought they were my, I'm becoming very peculiar. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know some of the things because I spent most of my time in blackouts, I think. I, it, it, it was, it was just terrible. And, and this man, he enabled me. He was an enabler. He used to go and get me a great big bottle of wine. And, but he wouldn't pour it for me. And I would wake up and I was shaking. And I, I would shake. And I put a towel in the sink and a bowl in the sink and a glass in the bowl. And I would slot this wine into the glass so I didn't waste any and i get it to my mouth. And he'd say, why do you put that stuff into you when when it does what it does to you? And he couldn't understand. And he and I said, well, I probably might be an alcoholic or something. I don't know. And anyway... He, he says, no, you're not. I'll teach you how to drink. And I'd always get out of it by taking lessons in how to drink. <laughs> get out of anything. Anyway, uh, when I went back to, um, I went to the probation office. I got, a, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, then, uh, you know, I'm in denial all the way down. I, you know, I just won't, I wouldn't admit that, that I needed help and I didn't know where to get help, really. And so, uh, he, uh, He'd gotten out, uh, I, I went to the bathroom this day and I decided I'd better have a miscarriage. So I'd got a bottle of vodka and a six pack of beer and I sat there and got drunk and he came home and he knocked in the door. He said, are you in there? And I said, yes, I'm in here. And so if, half an hour later he comes back and he says, well, what's going on in there? And I'm drunk by this time, you know, and I said, I'm, I'm having a miscarriage, you know, just as if I'm having a slice of bread or something. I don't know. <laughs> having a miscarriage. And he says, well, I'm going to call the doctor. And so, boy, I was out of there real fast. I got the bottle in, into the laundry bag and, and the stash of the beer cans and stuff. And I came out and I had had the abortion or whatever it was. I was the miscarriage. And so it was my turn to go to court. And uh, I went to court and I would only got the, uh, uh, probation and a fine too. And when I got home, he was sitting there and he had all his bags packed. And I said, uh, where are we going? And he says, we're not going anywhere. He says, I'm leaving you. He says, this is a damn three ring circus. I've only been married to you one year and I can't take you one minute more. And he walked out. And that man did me the greatest favor that he ever did. He drove off and I'm running after the car, screaming, asking him for some money. I said, I need groceries, and I have my high heels under my my armpits because can't run in high heels, and I'm running down, and all the neighbors come out to see what the fracas is, and of course, I hated neighbors, you know, because, oh, God, I just hated neighbors. I just knew they were all after me, and they didn't want me in the neighborhood, and I suppose they didn't. I know that they didn't, and anyway... Uh, he, he just drove off, and I had to walk back and put my shoes on and walk past all these tittering, whispering people. And I, whether it was that bad or not, but it was that bad at, to, to me at the time, and I went home, and I, and I got angry. I got so angry. I had nothing left to sell, absolutely nothing to sell, because I had done it all before. And uh, I thought, God, I've got to get sober. I've got to get sober, and I got this idea. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get sober. I'm going to get sober for three months get my system all cleaned out, and I will go back to drinking just like it was when it was, I was 17. And only next time I will come in, I will do this earlier. I will take a three-month leave of absence from drinking, and I will, and, and this I did. I went, I went into, uh, I got a job, uh, I got sober. It was tough, but I got sober, and I went to the embassy club, and I got a job. I had worked at that earlier when I had come down here. And uh, I was a chip girl. And so I, 
the three months was almost up and God stepped into my life because he sent a girl by the name of Ruby and she was uh, uh, one of the waitresses in the cafeteria there and she uh, was having a break and I went in and I said, Ruby, I'm going out and tie one on tonight. Do you want to come with me? And she says, no, thanks. And I said, oh, come on, Ruby. And I kept on coaxing her. She says, Ellen, if I went with you, I'd only drink Coke. And I said, why would you drink a Coke? And she said, because I'm an alcoholic and I have two and a half years in uh, sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous. And then she chattered on and she chattered on and she chattered on. <laughs> and, and the only thing I could remember, she said to me, if you ever find out that you have a drinking problem, look in any telephone book under Alcoholics Anonymous and you look at the phone number and you dial the phone number. She's explicit. She knows what alcoholics are like. You know, they're, you know, you have to be told they're just exactly what to do. And she says, and you tell them that you need some help and they will come and they will help you. And so that night I went out and I got drunk and I went home and I looked in that telephone book and sure enough, there it was, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought about that a lot. And, and then my drinking was getting worse and worse and worse. And I finally I thought, I can't go any further. My body was yellow. The whites of my eyes were yellow. I was scrawny. I was a mess. And finally, I had to call that number. I called that number in the morning. And the man answered the phone, and he, uh, the only thing he said was Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started to cry. I thought, what a terrible thing to have to step so far down as to go to a bunch of alcoholics. <laughs> uh, to talk about denial. I, I would just put it out of my mind that I was having a problem. It was something else. It was the, it's, they don't make booze like they used to. That's what it was, it was the favorite one. <laughs> they just don't make it like they used to. Or uh, maybe this American stuff isn't as good as that Canadian stuff. And then I'd remember the Canadian stuff wasn't that damn good either, you know, and I would get pretty sick. Anyway, uh, I, I just, uh, uh, I'm doing what the, the ten minute speaker did. <laughs> I've lost my tra my track. Oh yeah, I'm calling Al Al Alcoholics Anonymous. So anyway, he said to me, "How about?" <laughs> yeah, he's, he's my proctor. <laughs> he said to me, uh, "Well, would you like me to send a couple of women out to visit you?" And I said, "Are they alcoholic women?" And he said, "Oh yes." I said, "Oh no, I don't want them around here." And so, you know, my neighbor. Let me tell you, you know, my, I was afraid my neighbors would see them more than my landlord might see them. Well, m I want to tell you that my my neighbors would have been delighted. To see anybody take me away, because I, in the middle of the night, I would come home, you know, and when I was real drunk, I'd stagger in, and I'd slam their door, I'd break the lock on their door, and I'd go in there, and I'd slam their bedroom door open. By this time, they had heard me coming, two little Spanish kids, and they had a little baby in the crib, and... They would be sitting up with the sheets like this and their big brown eyes. And I, sometimes I had a carving knife and sometimes I didn't. But if, sometimes I'd, and I'd shake it at them and I'd say, if you don't stop talking about me to the, the neighbors, I'm going to kill you. And then I'd go out. And now don't you think that those people would love to have seen me be carried out by, <laughs> I mean, they would, they wouldn't have been, uh, yeah. and the landlord would have been delighted too. I owed him $1,500. He was another enabler. I used to really be able to peg an enabler. And so, anyway, he told me, uh, the, the guy on the phone said, well, look, he said, uh, uh, ask me where I live, and I told him. And he said, well, there's the maritime group, and it's very close to you. He said, it's an 8 o'clock meeting. Don't drink anymore, and you get over yourself over there. And so I said, okay, I will. Well, I got, I did. Uh, I, I got started to get ready because I knew it was going to take all day. And, uh, cause I was a mess and I was going to get some makeup on and I was going to curl my hair. And, uh, I started to curl my hair and I want to tell you something. I had black hair. My hair was black and I don't know how it got black. Just one day it was black and I never questioned it. I, I never, even when I sober, I didn't question that my hair had been black. And so I cur it was the pin curl days, you know, where you pin them all up. And so I had these off. And, d and during the day, I didn't have anything to drink. I had no money, had nothing. And he, uh, God, I just uh, walked over to that meeting. And I want to describe how I looked. My body was yellow again. And my, the whites of my eyes were yellow. And they're all streaked with red. I'm skinny as a bone. 
I don't have any underwear on because I don't have any anymore. It's long gone. And uh, then <laughs> that, and then, and I put on a dress uh, that came from Hen Fredericks of Hollywood originally. <laughs> and it had been bright red with white polka dots, a little tiny split going up, and the real low cut and spaghetti straps. The spaghetti straps were now hanging over and letting it go lower than ever. And uh, the, the the dress was dull, dull, dull red, and the, the, the polka dots were dull white, and the split went almost up to my hips. And there I am with these clear plastic shoes, standing in the doorway of the maritime group, and I have spaddle legs so I could, you know, balance myself, and I'm dying on my feet. And this guy comes up to me, and he looks, and he says, Welcome! And, I, <laughs> and he welcomed me! And God, I thought I may be in the right place after all. You know, I, he, he welcomed me. You know, I had been thrown out of just about every bar in, in Wilmington. Uh, they didn't like me, those bartenders. I, I was awful. I was a fighter. And one time I tried something I'd seen done in the movie. This guy in the movie had taken a bottle of beer, I smashed it on the counter, uh, you know, on the edge of the bar, and jumped over and chased the bartender out. I did it. I did that. And I smashed that bottle. I jumped over and fell on my ass. <laughs> and that was the, that's my whole life. That's the way it went. I always was doing things like that and falling on my butt. So anyway, they took me in. He took me in a little. He, he says, now stand and wait right there. And she he went back and he talked to this woman and she came, started to come forward. The, the closer she got, the faster she came and she just put her arms around me and she kind of rocked me in her arms. And she said, you're going to be all right now. You're going to be all right. And that was the first feeling of love that I ever had in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I have never walked into an AA meeting since that day that she, uh, you know, that, that, that I don't, I feel it. I feel that love. It, it's thick. It's healing. And we heal one another by loving one another. And, and, and it is, it's wonderful. So, uh, it wasn't, uh, well, they came the next day and they brought some other clothes for me. <laughs> that was nice of them. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, I stuck around and they never talked about the pills and they never talked about drugs. They just didn't think the drug addicts should be here. But I want you our drug addicts to know I will welcome you anywhere and I will fight for you anytime because it was a drug addict that saved my life. I kept going out and getting drunk and coming back, and you know, and it wasn't working. And it wasn't working for me. And they kept saying, read the book, read the book. And I would read the book, and by the time I read, got the end of a sentence, I couldn't remember what the first part of it said. I was full of these diet pills and bennies, and they didn't recognize them, but the drug addict girl did. And she walked up to me, and she says, hey, Ellen, he said, i got to talk to you. I, she says, you've got to get off that stuff. I know you're on it. And she said, but uh, you're never going to get sober if you don't. And so I said, well, I don't know, uh, I'll, I'll try. And so she said, well, if you, if you need me, you call me. And she said, but don't you call me because it's a long way from Santa Ana to Wilmington. And there were no freeways in those days. So I, uh, I said, okay, and I did. I, I, got off, I got off the pills, and, uh, and then I could read the book. And I thought, oh, my God, I could read this book. And I was l reading things I don't want to read about, like character defects and God and all these kind of things. I didn't want that at all. So I... Uh, I just, uh, I decided that maybe I ought to become willing. You know, you have to become willing for this, and then it starts the, the things in motion. So I became willing to come to believe in a power greater than myself, but I didn't know how to do it. So I went to a meeting that night, and uh, I had had, I was just coming off another one, I and because I, I had got the bright idea that, uh, Maybe I could drink now that I wasn't on the pills any longer. And that, that, what, I blew that out the window, but because I didn't even, I just stopped, stopped drinking in the bar and, and ran to the phone and said, got somebody to come and get me. And, uh, so I went to this meeting and I asked several people how they came to believe in God and uh, I didn't get any satisfactory answers until I came to a man by the name of Jack W. He's long dead now and he, he too saved my life. He said, well, Ellen, he says, I, I, I was an agnostic when I came, and I did not believe there was a God, but I became willing to, to believe. 
And I said, well, I'm willing. And so he said, I got cards, and I put on the cards, I believe, I believe there's a power greater than myself that will restore me to sanity. And he said, I put them in my car, in my office, and my uh, bathroom, all for my coffee pot. Well, I didn't have a car. I didn't have an office. I didn't. And I just had a little hovel. And, and, but, uh, and he says, and, and you, uh, you, every time you, your eyes fall on them, you say this. You say it now. You say it over and over again. I believe. I believe there's a power greater than myself that will restore me to sanity. And he said, I'm going to give you these prayers. And you go home, and I want you to get down on your knees, and I want you to ask God to help you. And then you say these prayers, and God will help you. And so I went home that night. I locked the front door. I pulled the drapes. I went into my bedroom, pulled the door closed, put a nightstand in front of it because I didn't want anybody to know I was going to pray to God. But I got down on my knees, and I first said the sassiest prayer I think he ever had. And I said, I don't believe you're there. But if there's one chance in a million that I'm wrong, will you help me? And then I started, I got down on my knees, and I said the prayers. And I got up, and I said, huh, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And I knew that, that you know, if there was really a God, he would have zapped me probably. But, you know, because he knew everything I did. If, if he's there, he'd know everything I did. And... Uh, I, and I, I, I zapped him. But you know, I thought nothing happened, but you know, that was on January the 15th, 1959, and it has not been necessary from that day to this that I take a drink. And, uh, so something happened. I still wanted to drink. I wanted to drink, but I would just about die, and then all of a sudden it would go away again. And that's something that didn't happen. I used to get, to want to die for a drink, and I'd finally get it. But this was different. And five months later, the bookie came back into my life and wanted a divorce. So, uh, I, of course, I, you know, I, I'm not uh, working everything. You know, I'm not too honest. I'm very manipulative, and I'm getting a car out of him, and I'm getting money out of him, and I'm getting the money for the divorce and, and money to support me because I don't th- I think I'm too weak to work. But I didn't. I and I got all this money, and I took off for Lake Tahoe, and I said I got to go out there. And everybody said, "Don't go, Ellen. Don't go." And I, somehow I, I just I just had to go there, and uh, and I didn't think I I, I didn't think I would uh, drink, but all the way up there, I st- the the nagging was there. It was nagging, and I was thinking drinking, and wondering if I could just once more, and or was it worth it, and all this. And finally, I, I got myself into such a state I was crying, and I wanted to drink so bad, and I pulled my car into the side of the road, road, and I started to pray, and I prayed to God. And, and he wasn't doing anything. And finally I started screaming. I said, God, if you'll help me now, I will do anything for you for all the rest of my life. And the desire to drink was just lifted. And it has never returned. And I was felt so, I felt a peace that I had never felt before. And it was a most wonderful feeling. And I uh, went on up to the lake and I got a job there and I got the divorce. And then I came back down. To, and to live in Long Beach, and the first thing I did was get married again. Can you believe it? He was a newcomer, and <laughs> and, I, and uh, he was a newcomer, and I was a newcomer, and it was a disastrous marriage. We, we didn't, you know, we couldn't even talk to one another. He, we didn't talk to one another. We didn't fight. We didn't fight. And we didn't do anything. We didn't commune, and we didn't discuss anything. We just kind of lived and floated around together. And it was no marriage. And so uh, I, I once again got another divorce. By that time, I had met him. <laughs> and he was sitting behind me in an AA meeting, and he was weighed 138, 37 pounds, it was, 137 pounds. And you want to see that mass of 240, I think he is, but he says he's not. <laughs> but I looked at those blue eyes of his, and I said to myself, I'm sure I could fatten him up. <laughs> now, I want you to know that he's been a marrying drunk, too, and I wasn't a marrying drunk. But we have been married, the day after this Christmas will be 25 years. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's great. And we've had our ups and downs, and we've ironed them out. But the best thing we ever did with one another in our marriage was sit down and discuss why don't we be best friends. I wouldn't talk to you, or I wouldn't answer you back, my best friend back, the way when you talk to me that way, and vice versa. And so we have become 
one another's best friends. Sometimes we forget that we're best friends, <laughs> but not always. Usually by the end of the day, it, everything's all right, and it's a good marriage. And, you know, for a couple of alcoholics like we were, it, it is wonderful. And uh, But uh, to get back to what I did, I'd like to tell you something about my sobriety because it's very important to me uh, that the things that I've done and, and the hurdles that I had to get over. The first thing that I did... Uh, was uh, I wanted to go back to school, and then and I thought about it, and I'd say, oh, I can't do that. I'm into my 40s, you know. I'm, I'm getting up into my 50s by this time, because this this marriage, the the five we were married five years to the other, the other one, you know, the, and uh, and so uh, before Red and I were married, uh, I I started school, and it was hard because you know, if you want to go to school, go, give it everything you've got. You know, you can always repeat anything at school if you if you fail. God doesn't mind if you fail. I didn't know that then. I thought I always had to be perfect. And so I I uh, took a medical assistant course, and I got a job uh, working in a doctor's office. And the only reason that I got the job in the doctor's office, you know, I had no background. Why did I go walk in and say I'm a drunk? Or what, where did you work before? Oh, in the bars, you know. <laughs> but he gave me a job because his wife was an, a member of this organization. And he knew what it was doing for her, and so he, and and I loved that man. He was real good to me. He was very good, and I worked for him for about five years. And uh, he came to me one day, and he said, "You know," he says, "I just noticed that Orange Coast College has a class. It's out of uh, Hogue Memorial Hospital for a cardio technician, and you don't want to work for a, 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 a just a GP all the rest of your life." I said, "Well, I've been real happy here." And he says, "You, you can do better. You can do better." And so I started this class, and he used to come in. That man came in. He did not. He was a doctor, but he did not understand alcoholism at all. But he was so kind and he was so good. I would ask him questions when he'd come in in the morning, and he would tell me the best he could. The next morning, he would come back in, and he would bring a book or two books or three books, and he would have the pages marked and underlined all the all that I had asked. And it must have taken him hours to find that. And he did that, and he got me through that that class. And he showed me the EKGs, and I was reading them for him before I left, you know. And uh, and he, you know, sometimes I would be wrong, and, and but I didn't do that. And then I had to, t- of course, when you're going into anything like uh, the cardio, you have to have the X-ray and everything else. So I had to go become an X-ray technician and the whole business, and, you know. And it took a long time. I used to have to get up at four o'clock in the morning, but I I made up my mind that if I gave it all I got, if if I can give it all I've got, I will win. I will get out. And I did. And I I got to a job with a group of uh, cardiologists, and then later on I went into the Long Beach Memorial Hospital, and I was the cardio tech there. And and I loved that job. Oh God, I loved that. Yeah, I had I had earned that. And I my it made, gave me a self esteem. I'd have a white jacket on and a stethoscope. I've got that stethoscope at home yet. And every once in a while I go around listening to. Oh, I will raise your keys now and I listen to their heartbeats and they're fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I do this and I really and I medicate them and I give them their shots and everything. It saves a lot of money. <laughs> Anyway, I used to come in every morning that I worked there, and I worked there for about six years, I think, and then I retired because I was getting to retirement age, and uh, I uh, would go into the, the dress, the patient's dressing room. It was just a little curtained-off place, and I would and I would say my prayers, and I I go in and I'd say, "Hey God, it's Ellen. Ain't this a long way from Avalon Boulevard?" And it was. I am no more like that person I was that I came in than fly. I never wanted to be a person like that. I wanted to be a lady. And I, and sometimes I am, but sometimes I'm not. <laughs> sometimes I, I all cuss and, and you know, bad language is not spiritual growth, believe me. Uh, you know, it is a sign that you're not growing very spiritually if you're, if you're going to, uh, get up and use dirty words at the podium. And I, they slip off. <laughs> Once in a while, I used to be able to string them out a mile long in a bar. <laughs> Never repeat my. <laughs> I'd always get be mad at somebody and getting even with somebody or something. But anyway, I don't have to be that way anymore. And, and I and I and I don't mind telling a lot of people in AA. I don't go around and tell my personal friends that I was a hooker or, or you know, or anything like that. You know, that's what I was. I I would 
I, if I had, to, had some money to drink, I did it the best, the easiest way I could. And, and that was it. And that's where, if you're healthy enough to stay there and you have nobody to put, to lock you up, that's what can happen to you. Because you cannot do anything for yourself but go the known way. And now, now the known way is no longer that life. Um, we, um, I, I've been retired and Red has just retired. Uh, I have more sobriety than he has and I'm older than he has, so I'm the chief of the family. <laughs> and I tell him all the time. <laughs> Anyway, uh, when I retired, I decided to start raising Yorkshire Terriers, and uh, I, I have uh, eight of them, and don't tell the animal control people, but that's how many I have. Count, that's counting the, the new puppies, the three-month-old puppies. They're, they're not really accountable. And uh, I got another, there's another one pregnant, and, and we, we just love those little things. Uh, Red wants me to cut down so we can do some traveling, but I think if we're going to have somebody else in, uh, in the house to take care of one dog, they might as well take care of ten. You know, <laughs> for the same price. <laughs> so I have a lady that does that. We can get away when we want now. And uh, uh, I started a little ceramic business. I Somewhere along the way, I when I first came to California, I got a job in a bar, and then I quit the bars because I couldn't work in the good places, and I, I went bought into a ceramic shop. My mother had been a potter, and so I was pretty well versed in it. And so I have two kilns, and I'm making birthday mugs for AA uh, people, and I'm trying to get them into those three stores down here, and they're not answering me. <laughs> and uh, and then I have mugs with the promises on them, and and I do all that, and I and I do other things. I I do orders for people, whatever they want, you know. And uh, I have a little, uh, and, but life has been very very good to me. Uh, my family have all gone, and. Uh, so uh, I just, this is all I have here, and his three daughters. And uh, they're not my daughters, but the youngest one I think is, <laughs> because uh, I, I practically raised her. And, and so I've had all these good things in, in my sobriety. Um, but just remember, if, if whatever you want, you can be anything you want if, if you give it all you've got. And give this program all you've got. It, it, it takes a lot. You work those 12 steps, and you work the... Um, it was just for today's. Those just for today's will get your eyeballs turned out. You know, we do have our eyeballs in and glued tight, but they get them out the just for today's. And if you work each one for a week, you will become a different person in that time. And some of the, some of them have only nine and there. there's another set of just for today's are 12. And, uh, so I, uh, it's just about time for me to quit. Uh, and I want to, uh, Tell you a few little things here. I was going through some stuff that I have not seen in 25 to 30 years. And it says here, please, Lord, let me see. Can't read it. <laughs> oh, dear, uh, please, Lord, teach us to laugh again. But God, don't ever let us forget that we cried. So, and it was very impressive to me when I got it in it. And I always remember what I was like and what I am like now. And, and it's a great feeling. So don't be ashamed of to get down on your knees to get back on your feet. Just keep on going and plugging. Give it everything you've got. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.